All right, welcome everybody. Wall Street Jesus here. What's today? Thursday? I lost all track of time and thought. Today I'm dizzy. Uh, today's Thursday. We got a post market webinar. Uh, talk a little bit of what's been going on in the markets. But more importantly, uh, I had Mr. Ronchero back, a uh, trader out of the steam room. For some of you who may not know him, um, we trade and run our mouths together all day, every day uh, in an attempt to make some money. Um, but, you know, Ronchero, we had him on here originally about a month ago and um, a lot of requests to bring him back on, talk more about his strategy, where he's come from. He's got a nice past. Um, you know, he's got some experience under his belt. That always helps. A lot of decent information coming out of that. Um, and I want to rack his brain a little bit. I want to talk um, because I've been getting this question a lot, and I want to bring some of the more seasoned traders on these webinars. And we talk a little bit about um, when did light bulbs officially go off, okay? Maybe there wasn't one moment or one thing, uh, but something happened on the path throughout our career um, that gave us hope, that gave us, that told us now maybe we have a legitimate shot in this game, okay? Because as a lot of you guys know out there, uh, whether you're new to the game or have been around a couple of years, um, it can get quite frustrating. You get lost amongst the noise. Um, and when you don't have a set game plan strategy, it can get really frustrating. Uh, but if you talk to most traders, again, it may not be one thing, but something happened um, in the span of their career, which set them on the right path to the way they are now. And that's ultimately, you know, playing a game we all love, right? It's legalized. Well, gambling is legal now anyway, but the biggest casino in the world, uh, we gamble for a living, whether you look, whether you want to admit it or not, you're ultimate goal in this game is to become a professional gambler um and you know when you enjoy something that much and you can make money doing it there's nothing better in life period okay so um i want to rack his brain a little bit about that i'll also talk about um my career i think you guys will find it interesting because it's something you're not going to hear from a lot of traders and when you hear it you'll um understand why but we'll talk about that and we'll get uh, we'll dive into Ronchero's strategy as well and how he, he incorporates flow sentiment now, right, Ronchero? You're really starting to get into that sentiment thing, finding a lot of use there, um, and obviously the tape reading and option writing and all that stuff. Uh, so, Ronchero, give a quick hello. What's up to everybody out there? Hey, what's good? How's everybody doing? And um, we'll get rolling here. All right, so let's just touch on the market first off, Ronchero. Uh, today was a fun day okay a busy day a fun day um a lot of momentum names just continue to explode here uh if you're day trading there's a decent amount of juice out there so that's good um swing trading could be a little frustrating because you don't want to chase some of these things if you know if you want to hang on to them with some time behind it um but also at the same time we've had some really good looking action out there coming to, as I like to call, they were buying blood. That really started to come to life. And that's always a good thing because uh, you feel like you're missing out. One in particular that uh, a lot of us own, you own, Runcher, we've been talking about it all day, is that Campbell's Soup, uh, CPB, uh, which is basically the definition of when these guys, these wise guys come in and sweep up blood. Let me go to daily here and you can see. Uh, where are we here? Here to date? Is that good? That's good. All right. And you guys know we've been talking about this name for quite a bit, right? Uh, Gap Down, these staple names, the whole group was just lit up. I mean, these things got destroyed is an understatement, okay? And then all of a sudden we start to see some sweeper activity come into a name like this, okay? And what I like to say is, you know, the first couple of sweepers, I look at them and I say, oh, you know, they're nuts. They're buying this thing. They need a head exam and this thing's been going down for a year straight, you know. And then as each and every order hits the board, hits the tape, you know, by the fourth, fifth one, that's when it knocks me upside the head and says, you know, okay, somebody's really getting behind this thing. They're buying into the weakness. They don't care this thing is not reacting it's still continuing to look like crap 
Um, and as long as they keep coming, you know, that's a very, very promising sign, okay? Because they can be early. I mean, these guys don't worry about, trust me, they're not concerned about being early because they got enough ammo to come in and continue to buy, you know, at cheaper prices if they feel the opportunity is still there, okay? Uh, but then all of a sudden, you know, when you least expect it, right? We had a flush to new lows, still look like garbage. Then this candle here, just a reversal, and then put a couple decent days together. And then today, the flow just exploded um, into the gap here. A lot of players calling for that gap fill now. Um, but already, picture perfect setup there. A lot of us in the green, uh, so we're happy campers. Um, when did you – did you take any – cute strategy behind this run Gero, this Campbell soup, or is it just something uh, you were looking to build a position in the November? How'd you approach this one? No. So I was just like IGT. Right. I mean, I pay, when you start chirping about stuff, I pay attention and I write it down and I just keep an eye on it. And right. Campbell's you were, I knew you had gotten in and then they kept coming back and kept coming back and kept coming back and you kept talking about it. And I was like, okay, I have to be in, you know, the um, right. squeezometer was, was low short term. Uh, trader sentiment, everything else lined up, and you're on the mic screaming about it. So I'm going to grab some. <laughs> yeah. And so you didn't take, because uh, I know a lot of times, sometimes you'll um, write some shorter duration type, you know, some calls there, right? Taking some premium. Uh, this is something you just were looking to build a position into the weakness because of all the activity, sentiment lining up, and basically just a clean, clean as a whistle trade there. Yeah, exactly. This, this is not one that I'm going to, hold long term or roll out into the future like I right. would with like a I'm pretty selective when I do that like I'll do that with a more of the high beta ones like a salesforce.com or google um, that was a nice I'll one look, too by the way you had I'll, the sales yeah. yeah yeah the salesforce is good right now it's good um and then kind of the same thing with with the google if I see somebody come in long dated far out of the money and it's moving well then what I'll try to do is I'll try to stay in the short-term ones and roll them all the way to that far dated one, but gotcha. it's hard to do. Right, it's not right. easy so, to do. And I realized that that's another thing um, I've taken away from a lot of your trades. If you have a decent spot on a name you like, like a Salesforce, that's when you'll take the approach, right? Where you'll look to roll and keep a piece because you want that exposure um, because you never know, like a name like Salesforce, you never know when that, dip opportunity is going to come and you, it it may never come right and that's right. the problem with a lot of these stronger names so what you like to do is if you get that decent entry there and you know you, you got a nice profitable trade from there what you do is roll out and roll up right you like to roll up strikes as well yeah exactly so if, if i get like a five or a ten point move then that's my first roll and typically if i'm rolling like at the highs then i'll also look to sell a little bit of premium just to keep money coming in. So the first roll I've paid for the position. And then if I'm selling premium, I'm just replenishing the cash back into the account. And it's just like a slow drip. So if I'm long, let's say I'm long 50 contracts and I've, and I rolled them up and I look to sell premium against, I don't sell the entire 50 contracts against it. I'll sell like 25. Just right. that, that way I'm not, I, if it, if it goes berserk and takes off, I'm capped on 25, but 25 are running free. Does right. That makes sense. Still out of the other end. Exactly. But, that makes but sense. if it, but if it doesn't, and if it doesn't take off, I just keep the premium as it expires. Or if I collect, let's say 80% of that premium, I'll buy it back and then I'll look to do it again. Yeah. And what happens a lot of times, okay. We're, I mean, now is a bad example because you got names going bananas here, but in, you know, a normal even bull market condition, you'll get a ramp, like you were saying, you rattle off whatever it is, five to 10 points, and you get some consolidation, you get a breather. And while you're in that consolidation, your approach, you're making some money while waiting, right? A lot of traders get impatient, they're not making any money, they'll get out of the name, look for something else that's moving. You don't really have to do that because you're taking in some premium uh, and you're making money while you're just sitting still, basically. Exactly. And the original position's already paid for because I rolled it up. Exactly. Right. Off the pro and see, that's one thing. Uh, and it's a lot, it's more difficult. It's easier said than done, but it's more difficult to really introduce to a lot of newer traders, you know, in the steam room or on these webinars. 
but I, it always bothered me. Here's what bothers me a lot. Even now I'm seeing it, okay? You get, let's say, for example, um, I'm trying to get the best example, but I'll just use the name Tesla, okay? And let's say you get some sweeper activity right here into the lows. You had sentiment lineup. You know, exactly what Ronchero was just explaining, just the sweet spot, right? Initial activity off a pullback, um, first sign of sweepers, everything lines up, you get that entry, okay? So now you get this pop, and you still want to be, you still want exposure in Tesla, okay? But at the same time, you realize that you have nice profits, um, you, you know, you have time against you always when you're playing options. So it might be a prudent time to lock in some profit and at least roll. But what a lot of players do is they'll sell, lock in the profit. They won't roll. And then I see them a couple of days later on Chero. They're buying Tesla at higher levels. You understand? A couple of days later. Where yeah, that's where you get, that, you're going to beat up. Yeah, and exactly. And all you needed to do, you know, if you like a name like Tesla and you had that sweet spot entry, you know, leave a runner, roll some, leave a piece, so at least you have that exposure just in case you do, you don't get that pullback. Uh, but I see so many traders, you know, running into trouble, chasing. I call it climbing the ladder. They just trade the same names, you know, but every couple of days they have higher and higher entries. And, you know, eventually you chase the top, get caught in the reversal of the flush, and you're giving it all back. You know, AMD is a perfect example. Um, and guys, this is, you know, we see this out of the flow constantly. This is how the, the big boys, um, the smart money out there catch these big trend trades um, in these, you know, in these juicy names by rolling up, rolling out continuously um, if they, you know, get in heavily behind the name. Today in AMD, I don't know if you guys saw, I know you guys in the room did, but those of you on Twitter or whatever, I posted on my personal Twitter a monster roll in amd okay uh the guy i think when the stock was at 10 bucks we tracked it down when amd was at 10 bucks uh bought those calls for 85 cents sold them for four and change today came out of 20 million bucks out of that position 20 million all right and what he did was he took i think it was 7 million of that 20 and rolled up and out in AMD calls, he went out to Jan again, up and out. So now he's got seven million still in the trade. Okay, if it continues to go, that's great. If there's a breather, that's fine. You know, and he paid himself by putting thirteen million in his pocket. And that, you know, that's where you avoid chasing these things because I realize a lot. A lot of you guys love these names, love to trade these names, but when you're climbing the ladder and getting those bad entries, eventually it's going to bite you in the ass. All right. So, but anyway, what I was getting at, a lot of nice action out there today. Exciting stuff. Um, there's a lot of stuff scorched. You know, the names like the IQs of the world. Look at this thing. I mean, is this crazy or what? You know, that we were just playing this thing and excited about the move down here. And you look now, this thing was up huge today. Did you see this IQ today? Yeah, I did. I'm going to ask MJ for a loan. Oh, my God. And, you know, a lot of you guys know MJ in the room. Uh, MJ's got a nice score on this thing. I, I think something absurd. I think she put 400 bucks into the trade, and it's worth, what, six grand or something? <laughs> Nuts like that. Uh, so good for MJ. But there, there's been a lot of big winners here. And that's when you we need to take a step back and start to be careful, okay? And here's the thing, okay? I'll leave it at this, and then we're going to start talking on Chero and just strategy um, because, I mean, it's a waste of time to talk about the winners. You know, we're not getting anywhere. But now is a perfect time, okay? If you are too long and if you get caught in the flush here, it will hurt. Now is the time where you start to take measures to avoid that, okay? There are several things to do. I, I know Ronchero's got uh, um, options. He, he, he looks over as far as protection and so forth. I mean, I'll throw out a couple quick ones. You can size down is the easiest thing, okay? Just take down your size dramatically. You still participate in the momentum. But if you get caught in a flush, not only avoid getting hit over the head, you'll have the ammo to fire for the next buying opportunity that's going to set up just like this one, all right? I mean, people forget what kind of sweet spot we had out of the, the most recent correction that set up all this. 
All right, so you could size down, make sure you take some of the shorter term profits off the table. Okay, so if you're in July's and you got some nice profits you want to hang on to, lock those up, roll out for more time just in case there's a breather here. Okay, and there's other strategies like um, Ronchero was talking about the last time he was on, um, you know, just putting on some protection. Protection is cheap now. You see where the VIX is these days? Okay, puts right now are dirt cheap. You could put on some simple spy puts, you know, depending on, you know, how much you're on on the long side. You get a gauge of how much protection you want to put on, but do something. If you get caught in a flush here and you're shocked, you know, you're taken by surprise and saying, oh, my God, what happened to the market? Why did this happen? Don't say you weren't warned. This is the warning signs here, guys. When you see this type of price action, when you see this type of sentiment, when you see everything exploding in front of you, these are the times you got to take notice and be careful, just like back in January. OK, just like back in January. And then eventually we get a little rest consolidation um, and then we're ready to fire new bullets uh, off the new initial activity. All right. Let's get into um, a couple things on the trading end uh, that I really wanted to get to because we can't stick around all night. All right. I want to talk about light bulbs. All right. What I mean by light bulbs, if you talk to a lot of the more experienced traders out there that have been playing this game for a while, the majority have had something happen in their career, something click or something that they noticed that may have been right in front of them the whole time, okay, or a change of an approach, you guys know what I'm talking about, that really set them straight and got them on the right path to profitability, all right? I want to get into um, Ronchero and because he's got an interesting background. You guys heard it. Uh, he took some lumps. You know, you heard it in the first webinar. So I want to get to run chair. I want to share mine quickly uh, so you get an idea of what set me straight. Okay. And you'll find this, I think, interesting because it's going to be a lot different than what you hear from most. I think early on in my career, okay, and Ron Chero, you're going to kick out of this because you know me a little bit here. I realize, like, you hear numbers constantly, right? 99% of the traders out there fail, right? You hear that all the time. And we know from experience, trading is one of the most difficult things to do, okay? Let's be honest. It's a really tough game as far as it, when the emotions play into it and everything else. So what I realized early in my career, as everybody around me was trying to emulate, you know, be the next Paul Tudor Jones, right? They wanted, that was their goal. Their goal in the game was to be the best trader they can be, Okay. My path took a little detour, okay? When I, I experienced some fr frustration early on and I would just look around me and see a lot of traders failing. And I guess it was in my gambling background, but light bulbs went off and told me that I need to take a different approach if I'm going to last, if I'm going to succeed in this game. And what I mean by that is I realized early on that as a trader, I sucked. OK, I'm being and you hear me say that to this day, Ron Cheryl, right? As a trader, I'm not a good trader, period. I'd be the first to admit it. OK, what I mean by that, you talk to traders out there, they're like, oh, yeah, I can trade Bitcoin. I can trade nipple. I can trade Ethereum. I can trade anything. That's that wasn't the case for me. Right from the get go. I learned that early on. OK, so what I realized, though, is. One thing, I had a, a gambling background. My family was gamblers. I was around a lot of professional gamblers. You hear, you guys hear me share those stories a lot. And I took a professional gambling approach to this game. And that's what really, when I started to see the light and things started to click, you know, that's where money management really started to make, you know, a ton of sense of uh, watching my risk, of uh, basically treating every name as just a potential winner or loser and nothing more, you know, and it allowed me to stay away from all the noise that uh, a lot of newer traders get trapped in. Okay. And, and I get a kick out of like in the steam room and you hear me uh, bust chops, Ronchero. I bust your chops, Lucci chops a lot of times, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of experienced guys and a lot of newer guys that are trading actively. And 
Like, if I did that, smoke would come out of my ears. You know, getting on the long side. Okay, now we're getting on the put side. Oh, we're looking at this one. Oh, this one, this alert just went off. And this alert just went off. Where, you know, that's not an approach that I take in this game. I mean, basically, my approach is if I see, you know, the sharp money placing bets, I'm looking to place my bet next to that money. You know, and rather than I'm looking to trade the name as a lot of traders do. So as as crazy as it may seem, that that little thing, okay, may sound little to you guys, but to me it was huge. That change in approach for me really set me on the right path and allowed me to do the things I needed to do to be successful in this game, to be as disciplined as I needed to be in this game. Um, so I found that interesting throughout my career and I envy a lot of the traders who can can do what I can. Um, talk a little bit about yourself, Ronchero. I know, unlike, see, I didn't go through a tough time like you did per se. In other words, I didn't really get creamed. I didn't get that. I didn't catch that big beating. Um, but you did. And <laughs> I'm interested to hear, you know, what? when did light bulbs go off? Did you have any event like that throughout your career? Yeah. So, you know, I think it was after the 2009 pull that i mean i was i was lucky because i was in cash at that point i was unlucky because i went through a divorce which kind of blew up my account for the third time and i was out of the market and that's when i found somebody who was a former floor trader that was willing to mentor me about how options actually work and you know you hear lucci talk all the time about you don't need to know greeks you don't need to know Delta, implied volatility, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, I, I didn't know Lucci or you guys at that time. So that's what I did. I, I learned the details of it because I made so many mistakes not understanding. So that was my first light bulb moment. And that's when I built back up again from scratch where I, I had to scrape together money and save it up. And then I was buying, you know, one, two, three, four, five contracts at a time on what I perceived to be quality names and then sold at that time, they didn't have a lot of weekly options. There were monthlies. So I'd right. have to sell premium against on monthlies and just sit there and, and wait. So it was a really difficult game to play because it takes so long in that environment to stack. And I was, I was afraid to just jump into something and get long and, and be a cowboy again, because I had gotten, smacked around three times i was like i can't sure. i can't handle it a fourth time yeah, so um yeah. so when i you know i i stacked and I, I built back up and then um to where i am i met you guys probably a year or so ago and i don't remember how it happened i think it was because of a tweet so i came in just to kind of see what was going on and, and what you did and i couldn't figure out what the difference was between you and lucci because you guys had two different websites going and i i, I came into the steam room just to kind of observe what was going on. And I had been, I don't know, I think to two different rooms that were watching unusual option activity and neither one of them clicked for me. But when I got here, they started to click. And then when I took Lucci's course and he taught me tape reading, that's when a lot of other things started to come together for me to be able to trade shorter term. I'm still pretty good when it comes to um, swing trading and selling against those. Right. But the short-term trading, I was not good at at all until I got here. And I think I went through, I mean, every single master course that Lucci did where he you know, repeated it, I, I showed back up again. And every time I showed back up again, I, I'd learned something different that was very nuanced in what he was talking about that made a big difference in how I executed. And if I'm more prepared and know what to do, then that's what keeps my emotions in check. And that's what allows me to make better decisions. So those were that that's kind of my light bulb moment being in this room. Yeah. And so basically when you came out, I mean, you were pretty much rock bottom, right? I mean, it takes oh, for a lot, sure. It takes a lot of will just to even attempt to bounce back from there uh, after getting lumped up. You know, not many people are gonna do that. Uh, so basically, I, I'm trying. What I'm trying to get at too, before you even got to us, did something? Was it just market related? Was it? Um, did something 
click that really started to get the ball rolling? Was I think you mentioned, was it just a matter of correcting the mistakes that knocked you out beforehand that, you know, got the ball rolling? What what changed from, you know, before you blew yourself up to the path after you blew yourself up? Was there any major change in your approach or, your, you know, in the approach of training? Yeah, the thing that saves my butt over and over and over again is when the VIX is at a level where I can go out and buy some zombie apocalypse puts and sprinkle them around. And then when and if we get that pull, that, that, that just puts a lot of money in my pocket. So when we, the last time you had me on, it was like a day or two days before we started to get the huge pull. Yeah. And I already had those zombie apocalypse puts on and that saved my butt. So. Right you know, learning how to protect is what really, that, that was like the one thing for me that allowed me to be able to be more aggressive is knowing that if I go to bed and tomorrow I wake up and we're down 2,500 points, I'm still going to be making a lot of money. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's a big deal. And you guys got to understand, I know there's, I, and I'm not going to mention names, but there, there are a lot of you out there that are prepared for when the music stops here okay and it's almost like you don't even want to focus on that you'll deal with it when it comes and you you just you can't take that approach in this game okay and you know like ronchero saying when when it gets to times where he knows he needs to start looking at protection that there's more risk because of the upside we've been seeing or you know any case like that he's going to go put on you know, some protection that if we do get hit, that's going to replenish some of the losses on the, you know, as far as long exposure. Okay. Now, but again, I mentioned a couple of things early on, simple things that you guys can do. Now, the problem is, is you, you're going to miss out on some upside opportunity. And I think that's what traders can't stomach run. So, you know, if they size down here, they're saying, okay, if I size down, what happens if we rally for another three weeks? You know, if I if I only take a quarter of the position and a, a full position, you know, that's a lot of money I'm leaving on, on the table there. And they're so focused on the money they can possibly make rather than worrying about how much money they made and how much they're going to hang on. And I always uh, – any any new trader that came around me, guys, I, I know it may be like a courting line or whatever, but I always used to tell them the difference between – a professional trader and, you know, the retail riffraff, as we like to call them out there, is simple. The professional uh, traders out there, they're going to make money on this rally just like the retail trader is. The only difference is they're going to keep a good chunk of the money and the riffraff give it all back and then some. That, that's the only difference. It's the only difference, Okay. In this type of market you see, right, you look on Twitter now, everyone's a guru on the long side. Even guys who were shorting into the lows and as bearish as can be are making money on the long side right now and claiming they know, you know, they know the game inside out. So it, you don't need to be a guru to make money in this type of market. But where, where the tough part is, is hanging on to the profits. And that's what ultimately like Ronchero said throughout his career, that's what ultimately, guys, is going to set you on the right course, is when you realize that when you get these washes, when you get these pulls, you're not giving everything back. That's when, officially, you're going to think you might have figured out something, right? And, and you mentioned, Ronchero, like, your protection, right? You you would put on some protection. It would be dirt cheap. You wouldn't, You weren't worried about or concerned about some of the money you may waste on the protection. But you know that if you if this market got hit over the head and your long side got hit over the head, it would replenish a decent chunk of those losses and you'd have some ammo to fire, you know, back down where everyone's buried, basically. And think about that for a second compared to where you were prior, where every time the market pulled, you would get lumped up, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, that's that's the whole that's the whole reason for it and a lot of people they just don't you know they don't they don't see the need for it and listen it doesn't you know if if, if we get a pullback of you know three or four hundred points those things aren't going to kick in those things th those things are, are there for when we have uh, you know a ten percent like 
five to 10% pull is where those things are going to, that's when they're going to pay. And, and everything else that's quality is going to be down with it. So that's when I'm taking that cash and I'm buying stuff that's on sale. I can go out and I can buy Google 10% lower. I can go out and I can buy Amazon 10% lower because I have the cash now to go do it. Yep. Yep. And that's, you know, again, that's, that's one approach. He, you know, he likes to take that approach. Me personally, I never, I never, for some reason, not that I think there's anything wrong with it because I talk about it with you guys all the time. I never was one to put on protection. I just, for some reason, I never, you know, I never got uh, to that state. What I would do is I was always a big fan of sizing down and becoming more selective. You know what I mean? Um, missing upside opportunities when the when everybody's bullish missing upside opportunities they never really bothered me you know if i missed opportunities off a pullback that bothers me a lot okay because that's when that's where my edge is there and i'm just not paying attention to it um what doesn't really bother me is missing the upside or not taking um, not playing as big as a part in the upside when everybody else is making money on the upside because, you know, I, I guess being around Runter, I know that this game, when everybody's making money, there's usually that thing that comes right around the corner, right? And it's just the same on the opposite side. When everybody's bearish and betting on further downside and lathered up in protection, what happens? All of a sudden, you get a rally like this. And everybody's scratching their head, wondering where it came from. And you know, over the my 20 years, you know, that's been the case uh, a lot more than not. So that's that's where I guess I get that frame of mind. Let yeah, me I, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just gonna, gonna say, and, and when when we started, when we went through that, when we went through that correction, there was a day back in April, and I was kind of in and out. Lucci and I were trading spy contracts because the swings were huge. Like the trading ranges were like four or 500 points every day. And, and that was working. And then there was one day where I think he was in Puerto Rico. The market started well, and it was a total head fake. And I had pushed, I went from, I was long. Um, I think I started long 25 spy contracts, then upped it to a uh, hundred. And then when I saw confirmation or what I thought was confirmation, I pushed up to a thousand contracts. So I had a hundred grand in, and then within, three or four minutes it was cut in half so i had to flip and go the other way and at the end of the day i wound up down nine grand but it was wow. one of those moments where i was like okay this all of this has changed and i don't know why and then that's when i started to key in on what you were talking about with uh short-term trader in uh, sentiment and then the, the squeezeometer and that that's where i was like okay i need to get myself back in check or i'm you know like the gimbal's gonna freaking go off the edge of the map and i'm gonna tumble out into space again so that's when i started to pay attention to what you were talking about and that settled everything down so you know that's another thing is being able to adapt to what the market environment is doing because you can't tell the market what strategy you're going to use you have to identify what's happening and then apply the correct strategy to what's going on. Yeah, and that that goes to again the the trader instincts, guys. That I, again, I'm being dead honest with you. You know, you won't hear it from most traders, right? Especially on a webinar. I I couldn't get myself in in that type of position. I I don't trust my degenerate instincts. You understand? That's that's what I'm most fearful of. And so what I had to figure out basically is what did I need to do to keep those degenerate emotions in check? You know what I mean? So that's why, you know, we joke around a lot, but I can't play the short side. Okay. Cause you see what Runchero just said he did based on just off instinct and what happened in the past. And think about it. If you're a newer trader, you don't have that instinct. Okay. So that means you're getting lumped up and run over. But what he had to do is, he went from short, take, taking a lump, to now hopping on the long side to make up that money. That's an easier said than done when your bias is all leaned up on the bear side going in, okay? Not many traders can do that, especially who are new to the game. 
I almost got smoked on that Google today, by the way. <laughs> Yesterday, at the end of the day, when everything was headed back up, I was like, oh, we're in good shape. And like an idiot, I, I left the desk. I had a, I had an appointment and oh, I, I see, got to where I was going and I was down 10 grand at the end of the day on Google. I was yeah, like, I'm going to get reverse, smoked right? in the morning. So, I mean, fortunately, it came back and I held and just let that thing ride back up to where it was profitable again. But that was that was not easy to do. All I wanted to do was was dump it. I mean, I, I got zero sleep last night because I was all I was thinking was, how am I going to fix this mistake in the morning? Right, right, and luckily you, you had a yeah, nice I lucked out. There. I lucked yeah, out. You lucked out, but um, all right. Here's the thing, because a, a lot of things. See, a lot of people out there, I run into. Um, you know, they hear different trader stories, and like I said, you get tied up in trying to be that next great trader. And honestly, if I was to give advice, all right, to anybody new, I would say to get off that type of road and to actually focus on some of the simpler things that you can do, okay, to allow yourself to be successful, okay? So let's talk about um, a couple of things that, you know, from when I know Ronchero now, okay, you came in and you came into the room there, three things really that you weren't, you knew of, but weren't too familiar with or weren't incorporating into your trading style, okay? One, sweeper activity, two, sentiment, and three tape reading, right? Those were three yeah, main yeah. components out of um, the room that you've now. Sentiment wasn't a big part, but from what I'm, I, maybe I'm wrong, but from what I'm noticing, it's starting to play a bigger part. Am I wrong by saying that on your end? Or? Not at all. And that's that's when when I when I hear you, you know, say the same things over and over and over again. I'm like, okay, I, I need to listen because <laughs> because he's he's gonna save my, he's gonna save my butt on on some trades when I see something go a particular way. So yes, I pay attention. Okay, so uh, all right, and now a couple things. The the tape reading you mentioned this is interesting, especially from like the Lucci course. You apply a lot of that more on an intraday basis than you do on a swing trade. So correct. In other words. What about entries and stuff like that? Not really, just intraday day trading? Well, look at Campbell's Soup and IGT. Those are perfect examples to me of they were good spots on a chart and okay. nobody nobody wanted them right. except for these guys that were coming in and, and hitting them in the blood, right? And then right. I know you're at, I know you've traded IGT before. Um, I wasn't interested in Campbell's, but I couldn't ignore it because of what came in so i don't need tape to tell me to get in at that spot does that make okay. sense yeah of course of course and okay so now on the day trading end where does the tape reading help you the most like in other words give me an example or give us an example of something uh that's happened where uh without the tape reading you know it may have not have well, played out yeah. the same way today on google when we got up can you pull up a one minute chart on yeah, google yeah. Okay. All right. So when we came in um, this early on morning, this morning, yeah. So okay. um, you know we were we were gapping up, and from experience and from watching the tape on Google, I was like, okay, I know that there's going to be a pull at some point, and when we pull, I want to watch the tape and see where the buyers are coming back in. I didn't know where they'd come back in. I knew they would come back in though. So I just waited for that and just kept my eye on the tape. And when all of a sudden you started seeing the bid being lifted, I was like, okay, here they come. So I knew that I could continue to hang on. But if gotcha. I didn't if I didn't see that activity and then all of a sudden you could see the rug pull and all of a sudden, you know, you're you're not getting fills and it just keeps dumping and dumping, I know that, that then it's time for me to get out. Gotcha. Yeah, and you know, you want to hear something interesting? I remember with um, IGT just had news. John Richter saying IGT just had news that MGM using them for sports betting. That's new right here. Oh, shit. Are they up? <laughs> yeah, up about 35 cents after market. Okay. They had some uh, investor meeting today or analyst meeting. Yeah, we'll see how it looks tomorrow. Finally, it looks uh, um, like it's got some momentum there. Uh, but one thing I realized um, with the tape reading, where I said, wow, you know, 
especially on the day trade side, it can be really useful um, for some of these traders looking for that extra edge. So in other words, like if you're a casual swing trader, you may not find the value out of the tape reading that you would if you were like really diving in as a day trader. And I'll give you an example of a great setup as far as sweeper activity working with the tape reading that Lucci did, okay? There was, um, it was, I think the most recent correction, if I remember correctly, and we had, the flow was awful, nothing but put sweeper activity, bearish activity all damn day. I think you, Lucci, were doing cartwheels, all excited, shorting everything, making money, slapping five. I'm sitting here, sitting on my hands, didn't play anything all day. That's how awful the, the flow was, okay? And all of a sudden, I think it was around maybe 2.30, a quarter to three, it was late afternoon. Um, we break a new intraday low on the markets, okay, on SPY, we'll use as an example. And into that low, okay, and you could feel the, the fear there when we broke another intraday low. Like, we're, you could sense that people were thinking, okay, here we go. We're going to sell rapidly into the bell. There's no buyers. Here comes the selling. Let's get the hell out of the way. Okay. That was the feeling even I got, you know, I'm being honest. That's that's the feeling that was coming out of the, the, the price action. Then all of a sudden, and it always happens this way, just like these blood buyers we're talking about, boop, spy sweeper. Okay. And again, nothing huge, but stuck out like a sore thumb because we're seeing nothing but put sweeper activity all day. I said, all right, whatever, one spy sweeper, maybe he's drunk, maybe he fat fingered something, who knows what, right? Another spy sweeper and another spy sweeper. Okay, and now that's when my eyeballs pop out of my head thinking, all right, I got an opportunity here, you know what I mean? To look for some long exposure and maybe get a decent day trade out of it. All of a sudden, I think it was right around with those Micron missiles that came in. Then the Micron missiles came in. Then more action came in. Then we started squeezing in the markets. Uh, and I remember screaming about it, screaming about it, because, you know, I was pretty excited myself after being bored. And then I remember Lucci talking about the tape, okay? He was there, and like I said, shorting all day. You know, Lucci doesn't leave his desk when the market's falling apart. Uh, he loves that shit. Um, and then Lucci, who was bearish all day, was screaming about the tape, saying how there was just no sellers. There were no sellers there. And I remember him talking about that. And those, and there's no sellers here. If they want to buy this thing, they could get a big squeeze out of there's no sellers. And as he's saying that, we're seeing more call sweepers coming in, you know, hitting the board one after the other after the other. And, you know, at the time, the market wasn't squeezing hard per se we had you know you get those little rallies then you get like a pause and people think it's short-lived we may roll over again but during that pause you had Lucci talking about the tape um we were seeing spy sweepers come in and then you know it was a ginormous squeeze and and i was just saying you know without the sweeper activity there right if you had no idea what sweeper activity was and without Lucci talking about the tape like because even the tape on an intraday basis, even with sweeper activity, it allowed me to give it more room, right? If he's telling me he sees no selling there, and I see these the smart money coming and hitting, you know, the buy side on everything, you know, that allows me to have more confidence on a stronger move of upside there. And it just set up perfectly, and we were all talking about, you know, how that was just the perfect example of, you know, flow, tape, and sentiment all coming together and setting up a sweet spot opportunity. And, um, you know, those are those are the things, you know, those are the things you wait for in this game. Uh, you look to swing a hammer when they come across. Uh, do you um, do you see that a lot when it ties to flow? Like, do you see that on the tape reading and on specific day trades? Have you, have you dove into that yet to the aspect of where there's sweeper activity and I'm looking at the tape, how it sets up, and putting those two together. Yeah, Campbell's was like that today. Oh, so basically, we were seeing the activity come into Campbell's, and you were seeing nothing but, what, buyers, no sellers? Yeah, yeah there have been lots of buyers coming in. 
I mean, it was just like one after the other. And so it's like, all right, I'm in good shape here. This is going to, I'm going to let this run. And if you think about that, okay, think about, I mean, just that nugget you said right there. Campbell's Soup has had buying a good amount of it, right? And the stock couldn't get out of its own way at times, right? We would see the big boys come into blood, catch a little bounce, and then just fizzle out, right? We see that a lot of times. Um, And then today, you're saying you saw the tape. There was no sellers there. And today held a nice gain and was up a stick. So, I mean, that's that's a perfect example there. Um, anybody have any questions out there? Um, me and Roger were having a conversation here. I forgot this. this other people. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions on anything Ronchero has mentioned in regards to trading or uh, how he utilizes flow and the tape reading? Hold on. I got a question here, Melissa. Uh, Melissa's asking you, you came into the Lucci course with some experience in a good base. Uh, do you think she needs that type? Uh, do you think the course is? So she's asking, does the tape reading course, does she need a little more experience under her belt? Or she? do you think she can get uh, something out of it if she's uh, less experienced? And less no, I think if, 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 if anything, it's probably easier as a newer trader because you don't have bias, bad habits, and other things that you've already been taught. So if you're... If you're fresh going into it, you pick it up faster. I mean, it took me a good six months to pick it up, and I had to look at it relentlessly every day to figure it out. Yeah, and and see, Melissa, that that I think applies to anything um, you want to learn in this game that's new, okay? You may not come out of it and be able to put something to use. I think that's what everybody wants to do. You know, even people who come into the steam room – on the free trial, you know, they want to strike gold off the three days. Otherwise, they don't think it's worth it. But anything you learn in this game, whether you realize it or not, that information may not be as useful now as it will be three months from now. You know what I mean? It's more of, I think what I'm right, it's more of where you want to be as a trader. You know, is that something that you want to basically look to take advantage of um, as far as tape reading? Is that something you have the time to do? Is that something you think you'll find use of in the future, getting better at? I think that's the more important question to ask. You know, like I said, for example, if you are you know trading casually and you're a swing trader and you're, you know, you're putting on eight, six to eight bets a year, it may not be worth it for you, obviously. But if it's, you know, if this game is something you really want to dive into um, and want to learn about it, it it's more uh, more your path. You know what I mean? Uh, by the way, let me get to it here uh, just so people know because they're asking me already and I don't even know where I am. Guys, if you go to WallStreetJesus.com, first of all, because uh, I forget to mention, you can get all the information there. Uh, here's the product section. All right. You got the master course here. Uh, they got a discount, I think, running. So you can check it out there, all right? Everything's under the product section um, as far as the courses and stuff like that. Private Twitter under the product section as well. Uh, the Steam Room, the free trial is right here on the homepage, all right? Three days, no credit card required, no obligation. You come in, check out what Ronchero is up to. Uh, if you think it's for you, that's great. If not, no harm done. Um, and you go about what you were doing anyway. So that's basically why we did that. And I think the credit card too is a big thing. Uh, people don't like to be obligated there. All right. We got a couple more questions here, um, Ranchero, before we wrap it up. Yeah. How did you manage your risk starting again in 2009? That's a good question. So in other words, was, and I get this a lot too, and it's tough to give that blanket answer, but how would you define your risk management strategy post blow up in other words you know like certain people put a certain uh percentage into each position you know maybe they weight them equally do you have any sort of risk management process as far as that's concerned or it's more of a you know hands-on where i'm at at the time i need protection now type of thing so back in 2009 i mean I barely had any money, right? Like I, I had to live well below my means and just scrape and save, you know, nickels every month. And then what I was doing was I was looking for 
the best quality companies that I could find that had been beaten up after that pull, which wasn't too hard to find, right? There were a lot of good companies that, that had been decimated that were good buys. And I'd buy, you know, a couple of contracts. I'd buy two contracts. I'd buy three contracts, five contracts. And then I, you know, I would, I would sell, I'd write premium against them. Mm -hmm. And then as they went up, you know, you just roll up and write, roll up and write. And it was just patience. So my risk management at the time was writing against the longs because if they stayed flat or they went down a little bit, I wasn't losing on the underlying long core position. I was taking in premium and that was replenishing my cash. That makes sense? Yeah. So let me, so you basically, and this is interesting because a lot of people uh, take the opposite <clears throat> MJ, but the, you <laughs> were looking to take a conservative approach in building up rather than that degenerate scramble roll the dice aggressive approach i gotta get my money back after getting beat up right so you were taking the baby step route rather than all right you know what i'm gonna do i'm just gonna load up on this igt and it better work right that's basically i was i was scared of my own shadow i mean i i, I got crushed right i mean crushed life-changing crushed yeah, like, and, and that's what people don't, I don't think, really understand. There's a difference when you blow up a small account. You know, you just start. That's why when people bl complain about blowing up small accounts, you guys don't realize, you know, this is this is a pimple in your life, in your career, in this game. If the best thing you can do is blow up small accounts, it's the lumps like Ronchero took that you don't come back from. That's that's what you know. People are envious of in this Ranchero story is that he came back from getting lumped up. You know what I mean? Lumped up. And that's not easy to do. Um, so that's and he makes a good point. When you when you're dealing, let's say, with a smaller account, if you're gonna come in and say, All right, this is all I got, I'm gonna try to build up from there, you may look to be, you know, a lot more aggressive. But if you took a big beating, you know, nominally a big beating you're not going to be nowhere near as aggressive. And, you know, he took the conservative route, slowly building it up, learning some things on the way. And uh, honestly, I think probably right now, his main objective in this game is not to end up there anymore. I mean, that's, I think, what probably is the first thing on his mind day in, day out, um, is to not end up at that point and in that state again. Uh, because why? who the hell wants to be there? Am I right? Like, that's got to be something. Uh, it's good in a way that it happened. Obviously not good at the time. But that will always linger, and that will help you avoid getting into that predicament again. Yeah, for sure. That, and that's that was the whole that was the whole reason to to, to figure out um, the zombie apocalypse put scenario. Because it, 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 it happens, right? I mean, every... I don't know, every year or every two years or whatever time frame it is, somewhere something's going to happen where we're going to get a pull. And I just want to know that when we get a pull, it's not going to, like, I don't have to go down to the 7-Eleven and, and eat SpaghettiOs that night, right, right? Right, right? So, Right. It's not career ending, right? It's just a pull. Yep. You're going to lose some money. That's part of the game. Um, but you were ready for it. You were prepared for it. Uh, you you wish it didn't happen, but it happens and you're ready to um, stay on course and look at opportunities there. And there was a good question here I want to get to. Um, where was it? It was about coming back in. Uh, and MJ's got a, a question here, figures MJ. But MJ's saying, is it better to take that aggressive approach in when you first start building up or take a conservative approach. And MJ, we spoke about this numerous times. You know my answer. My answer is this, okay? Like, for example, you got IQ right now. You made a score, right? That's all fine and dandy. If you're going to sell the IQ and then go take a shot trying to find the next IQ, and if it's not, you're going to lose everything, then what did that accomplish? You were happy for a month. You may you were profitable for a month and you're right back to where you started again. You know, 
And that's why I think with a lot of newer traders, regardless of whether you're taking shots or not, I know with the smaller dollar amount, you're going to take shots. You have to, okay? But you have to look at the game through a different lens if your intentions are to stick around and do this for a living or to find consistency in it, okay? If you're treating this like you're betting the ball games or going to the racetrack, then it doesn't matter. You roll the dice, you hope you make some money, you lose some money, you have some fun, okay? But if you're looking to stick around in this game and find some consistency, you have to take the approach that it's not about this stock working out. You understand? It's not about this one stock. You gotta be able to run into a brick wall at times. There's two, three losers that you happen to touch. You got unlucky and you, you hit three losers in a row, okay? But you know that if you stick to, you know, like, again, for me, it's simple. If I stick to buying the best of the best initial activity out there, I know I'm going to have a hell of a lot more winners than losers. You understand? Whether IGT works out or not is irrelevant. It's irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. Okay? If IGT gets bought out tomorrow, okay, and I make a nice hit on it, you know, I, I a long time ago, I came to the point in my career, that's great. I'm happy. I made some money. But longer term, what's that mean? My wife and my daughter will probably bang me out and spend it in two weeks anyway. You know what I mean? It means nothing. A stock is either going to be a winner and a loser, and you got to get to the point where you're looking at this game, more winners than losers, more your wins are greater than losses, and at the end of the day, net-net, is there a plus next to that number? And once you get to that point, then sizing up and all that stuff uh, comes easy. But you got to get to that point. And MJ, getting to that point is not rolling the dice trying to find the next IQ each and every single time because, I mean, the numbers tell you, the you know market history tells you, you're going to run into losers. And then what do you do? That's why I was uh, chirping at her to roll up today. I was like, MJ, roll that up, roll it yeah. up. Yeah, she did roll once already, which is quite – I had to pull teeth, but she did it. Um, <laughs> she did roll up and out. So, yeah, she's screaming, I did. Uh, so I, I give her credit there. Uh, let's see a couple more questions here. Uh, Pablo saying, uh, does the course translate in Spanish? I don't know about that, Pablo. Um, I think he's talking about the Lucci course. If I think, what is it more of talk a little bit about the Lucci course quick while I run through the questions? What is it involved? Is it video? Is it hands on with Lucci? I know there's part of that in there. Uh, just so quickly, getting, quickly, you, a get, you get on, you get on a webinar just like this, and it's in the evening, you go for like an hour and a half. He goes from like a Tuesday to a Thursday and then you cover, he said, was it like 12 or 13 sessions? And then you cover, the, the beginning is tape reading, then you move to options, strategy, how to use them, how to apply them. And then the last session is his psychology. And then he does live market with you for, I think, five days. You get on in the morning with him. And then he's Dirty there with you hours, reading right? tape. He's helping you. He's helping you pick trades. So if you pay attention and you go through it, when you get to the part of the course where you're on with him in the morning and you're paying attention and you trade with him, you'll make whatever you spend on the course back and then some. And you know, th these guys don't pay me to come on here and, and do this or give me a commission. But Jay, you you, you probably should at this point, right? Ah. <laughs> but uh. <laughs> Oh, kidding aside, Pablo, there's the answer to your question. It's more of a hands-on, kind of what we do in the room, Pablo, where I'm on audio video, um, you know, all day, Lucci's on in the morning, you're trading live with him, and whether you're trading or not, you're going to get an idea of how he puts on trades, how he works them, um, you know, if you're looking, if you're interested in the, uh, uh, the selling, writing strategy that he's got going on, so... You know, it's more hands-on. I don't think you uh, you need it in Spanish to uh, figure it out. You're in the room, so I know who you are. I don't think you need that. Um, what else we got? Tim's got a decent question here, too. Um, everyone's curious about this. When it comes to the sweeper activity, right, I got a preference. I mean, everyone's got a preference, I guess, according to what type of style they trade. Is there any preference in the sweeper activity, you talked about a little bit. When I'm screaming, it usually gets your attention. Uh, but any preference as far as 
uh, type of order or technicals that you lean towards? So um, I don't like blocks, just like you don't like blocks. And I like sweepers, multiple sweepers, especially if they're coming into blood. And from a technical standpoint, I like certain technicals only from the standpoint of they're important to other traders. They're important to other institutions like the moving averages, whether it's the 50 or the 10 um, or the 200. And if sweepers come in at those levels, then my antennas are, are up because that's likely a good spot. So if something's pulled back, let's say to the 200 and it doesn't break, and then all of a sudden, you know, sweeper activity shows up, to me, that's a, a great opportunity to, to get into something. And I'll try to match the sweepers sometimes if they're so far out of the money that it doesn't make sense, but I like the spot. I'll go closer to the money so that when the option moves, the delta is giving me a better return on the option than the guy that's further out of the money. Right, right, right. So, yeah, we were talking about that. So, basically, what you was saying, um, let's say we were talking about this on a couple of webinars. Tim, you and I were talking about it, too. If action comes into a name that he likes the setup in, okay, he doesn't have to mimic that order. You know, he could, again, he's looking at, okay, sharp money's coming in here. They're thinking these lows are going to stick. I'm going to look, you know, to trade off the momentum and plays a different strike. He's not mimicking the line, mimicking the order per se. Um, so the answer to your question is, Tim, he is looking at some technicals um as the order flow comes in and tim was asking as far as anything to the downside um are you playing off just momentum or is there anything specific um when you guys are trading on the downside anything you're looking for no it's so downside is when is when you post in the room what the uh squeezometer is at sentiment, and yeah. where and where sentiment is and if if everybody's on one side of the boat I, I'm going to I'm going to start harvesting all the green that's in my account and I'm going to put on some protection short term to see if I can catch a pull. Gotcha. Yeah. So and, and basically the squeezometer, for those of you who are not aware, it's a short term sentiment indicator. Um, and basically Ron Charles looking for when um, coal buyers are getting a little too giddy and um, a little too bullish. They're all lined up on one side. Uh, that's when he's locking up some profits, uh, putting on some protection. And then a lot of times, guys, we see what we see is first we see that start to develop and it's a process more than anything else, right? It'll take a couple of days and then all of a sudden we'll see the flow turn and you'll see that momentum type activity coming on the put side. Uh, you're not going to see the momentum type put activity come in to green very rarely. We saw it a couple of times in um, the correction environment where we were down, then the market turned green, then some put sweepers came in. But a tape like this, for example, you're gonna see selective protection like we've been seeing, especially in ETF land. You're gonna see some exhaustion as far as names to the upside getting tired, reversals. And then what you'll eventually see is all of a sudden this board you know, light up red, all red, um, and very little green. Uh, so, you yeah, know, that's one of the things I look for. I'm not playing the downside, uh, but that's a sign of caution to me when sentiment's a little too bullish and the flow starts to, the lack of buying is there, nobody's buying anything, and we see some put sweepers uh, get aggressive. All right, guys, um, I think we were out of time here. Ronchero, thanks as always. We'll definitely have Ronchero back. Um, you guys know where to find him in the room. If you're in the room, you see him all day, every day. He's on Twitter as well. Uh, you could grab that off my Wall Street Jesus Twitter. Um, I tweeted out the webinar. His uh, handle's there with it. All right. And uh, we'll do it again. All right, guys, any questions you have, uh, you could go to wallstreetjesus.com. You know the free trial. You know the Lucci course there as well. Private Twitter, last tab on there. If you have any questions, you know where to hit me up. Good yeah, luck the rest can, of the week. They can hit me up in uh, direct message. There's still a lot of questions on here. So if you guys want to follow up, just hit me in direct message. Awesome. In Good point. Anybody have yeah. any questions? Um, members can hit up Mr. Ronchero on the DM in the room. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Ronchero, have a good night, buddy. Thanks, Jay. See you. All right. Be good.